Hi, welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. This is Rachel Fisher. Hi, this is Desi Jedekin. How's it going, Des? Um, pretty good. How about you? Wait a second. I think Charles Manson died. What? Breaking news. Oh my God, breaking news. I mean, I'm a bit conflicted about this. Obviously, he's a horrible person who deserves to die. Yeah. I mean, I'm not like sad, but at the same time, it's like, oh, like I did enjoy some of his crazy antics. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, he did have a lot of crazy antics. Um, like, I'm not sad. Oh, but here come the tributes. Here come the, the tributes. <laughs> here come the tributes on Twitter. Uh, wow, this is this is crazy. Breaking news. I was actually doing a podcast two nights ago, and we were on Manson Watch. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that it, was when he first went to the hospital. That's when right? he. Well, it was that when he. It was like they reported a second time, like he's still in stable condition. We're like that. We just want to know like how many days, if it's days he has to live, or if he, it's years he has to live. Um, the name of that podcast, by the way, it's it's Honey Radio with the Horror Honeys. I highly recommend it. I'm on the latest episode talking about serial killers on film. So we were having our own little Manson watch, and now he's gone during our show. Wow. Well, right. um, rest in <laughs> peace. I don't know what you say. I mean, the guy had a swastika on his forehead, yeah, among other really bad horrible. qualities. I mean, I guess I will give him credit for <laughs> doing one of the most... <laughs> well-known murders full-time is that a thing is there a hallmark card for that right you were like, so prolific in you your really i mean of all the serial murders i mean he wasn't a serial killer no. but like his crime was the crime of the century or last century wouldn't you say like i'll give it to over oj to me it's oh, a yeah. much more fascinating uh crime. It, it's the most famous it's so famous that people often conflate him they think he's a serial killer and he's actually not a serial killer he was a fucking piece of shit dickhead who coerced a bunch of people into killing right. a bunch of people but it's a fascinating case I yeah mean, for me right uh, he... it was maybe my first um foray into true crime i saw the um tv movie on like a saturday afternoon after the cartoons ended because i had no supervision so right. i would just keep watching shit so that was where I first saw the Jim Jones um, TV movie, like during a Saturday afternoon after cartoons and Helter Skelter. Right. Uh, and then I did read Helter Skelter, the book by Vincent Bugliosi in um, like junior high, like when I was like 12, <laughs> something like that. I don't even have a tweet to come up with on the spot right now. Oh, you don't? No, I just said we're recording our show right now. Yeah. It's That's kind of crazy. it. So, I mean... We're also doing another famous Hollywood area crime. We team, are. Ironically. It's uh -huh. very appropriate. This one took place um, almost a decade later, but I don't know. I think, I mean, th they're both crazy stories. They're crazy in different ways. Right. This story, for everyone um, who isn't familiar, we're going to be talking about the Hillside Strangler. Yeah. Yeah. So the Hillside Strangler is actually the Hillside Stranglers. It was originally thought while the crimes were happening that it was just one dude. Right. But then the big twist happened. And well, it's it, rare that two people will work together as a serial killer. Like, as a serial killer <clears throat> duo. Yeah, as a duo. It's usually a very solitary job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, not, not the right word, but right. like, it's yeah. A, it's there's, a, a, there's a few famous um, pairs for sure. Right. And this one, it was, it was two dudes also. So anyway, let's get started. So Kenneth Bianchi was born May 22nd, 1951 in Rochester, New York to an alcoholic woman. He was given up after two weeks after he was born and adopted by Francis Giliano and Nicholas Bianchi when he was three months old. Clearly, she took his name. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pronounce that name. If anyone wants to rake me over the coals for that, oh, you know what? Later. Skila Leone. Skila Leone. Yeah, it's, it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> no Italian in me whatsoever. <laughs> okay, me either. Oh wow. I mean, but I did a horrible job too. But anyways, yes. I'm, so they were. Yeah, he was I'm adopted. very sad. I can't pronounce that. Um, okay, so he was adopted when he was three months old. As a young child, Kenneth was a compulsive liar and also a bedwetter. Just and like our president. <laughs> <laughs> I 
look, this is how rumors get started. And I'm saying I'm happy to start this rumor. I think anything pee related, I ascribe to Donald at this point. Yeah, me too. It's just, it's like a word association. <laughs> I saw Donald. somebody on Twitter talking about how we shouldn't be excited about the idea of there being a piss tape. And to that, I say, you know what? Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. Our, okay? We're in the worst timeline right now. Seriously. Like this is, everyone's having a bad time right now. And the P tape sometimes is the only thing that keeps people waking up in the morning, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, let's get back to <clears throat> Kenneth Bianchi and his uh -huh. piss problems. Cause he had them. I don't know. I love the word bedwetter, by the way. It's like one of my favorite words. Really? Yeah. I don't I know. I just love the sound of it. It's also a great insult to call someone a bedwetter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I love it. Um, like anyways, it. okay. So, yeah. so he wet the bed. He wet the bed. And for anyone who knows anything about serial killers, there is what they call the serial killer trifecta or the triage, right? Which is three things they all kind of have in common that serial yeah. killers have in common. One of them is bedwetting, and the other one is a head trauma. And right. the third one is the mutilation or the torture or killing of animals. Right. Those are the three traits that uh, most of them have. Most of Some them have. Two, at least two of them. They I have at least two of them. And Kenneth Bianchi had the bedwetting and the pee problems. Uh, he would had a, he, he dribbled when he wasn't. <laughs> that's what it said in some of the books I was he reading. Dribbles, well, okay. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had some dribble problem. He had some incontinence. It's uh, yeah. There's definitely some kind of psychological thing going on there, right? And he also had some head trauma. He, by the time he was five, he was entering these trance-like states, and Bianchi's mother took him to a doctor where he was diagnosed with petite mal seizures, but told not to worry about it and that it was just a phase. He was also prone to throwing temper tantrums. Then here comes the head injury. When he was six years old, Bianchi fell off a jungle gym and landed on his face. And he was taken to the doctor again at age seven because he was still peeing himself. <clears throat> at age nine, he underwent treatment uh, with a psychiatrist for his urination problems and for his behavioral problems. Kenneth didn't do well in school despite his very high IQ. He often fought with his teachers and he was disruptive in class and he also exhibited these anger problems. And this is something I feel like is very indicative that he's a monster. When he was 12, he pulled down the pants of a six-year-old girl. Right, so he's always looking, he's already looking for vulnerable victims. Right. Like people who can't fight back or, right. you know, yeah. When you're 12, you should know better. Oh, That's, I mean, the difference between 12 and 6 is insane. It's like, insane. <clears throat> so he was he did that. Kenneth's father died in 1964 when he was 14, and Kenneth refused to show any emotion or even cry about it. In 1971, he graduated from high school and married his high school sweetheart. Their marriage was very short-lived, and the couple split after a week of being wow. married. Yeah, really short um, oh, excuse me. That was, no, oh, that comes later. They split after eight months. Okay. So somebody else in this story split after a week. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, they split after eight months. Kenneth actually, he really wanted to be a police officer, <laughs> uh, but he couldn't find work at the sheriff's office. So he got a job as a security guard for a time. And while working security at a jewelry store, Kenneth would often steal valuables and jewelry and give them to girlfriends or sex workers to impress them and to sort of have an upper hand right. with them. In 1977, <clears throat> Kenneth decides to move to Los Angeles to live with his cousin, Angelo Buono. Angelo Buono. I think it's just Bono. Bono? Mm -hmm. Angelo Bono. Or Buono. Buono. Yeah. <laughs> Bono. Spelled, I think it is Bono. I know it's spelled with a U. I am really, I, on behalf of all the Italians listening to this <laughs> show tonight, I'm sorry for it's butchering fine. all of your names. Angelo Bono was born October 5th, 1934, also in Rochester, New York. After his parents got divorced, he moved with his mother to Glendale, which is in right. Los Angeles. Like his cousin, Kenneth, Angelo also did poorly in school. 
He was sent to Paso Robles School for Boys, and there he was arrested for grand theft auto, which is pretty intense for a kid. Right. In 1955, he impregnated a girl from his high school. He married her but broke up with her shortly after. This was the one. He broke up with his wife he married from high school a week after. Okay. Angelo did not want um, anything to do with the child that he had gotten her pregnant with yeah he conceived uh he didn't want anything to do with the mother of his child so he just split Mm -hmm. that was that in 1956 he had another child with a different woman named mary castillo they got married and they had several more kids together and in 1964 mary had had enough because angelo was not He's not a nice dude, much like his cousin. Right. He was a fucking asshole. Uh, very abusive, very controlling, um, big old piece of shit. He was violent. He would rape her, and um, he would rape her anally often, uh, which was something that she she did not want to have, was not interested in having anal sex, so he would rape her to uh-huh. fulfill his desires. And Angelo basically just got pleasure from seeing his wife marry in he's pain. a sadist he's, he's like a, a classic sadist. he's a classic sadist so when mary went to angelo about child support after they got divorced which he had been refusing to pay she finally went to him and was like look you need to pay child support he whips a gun out and points it at her stomach and is like i'm gonna fucking kill you Ugh. And that was the last time that she got into contact with him. She's like, okay, you know. In 1967, Angelo moved in with his girlfriend, Nanette Campina. She had kids of her own. And Angelo began sexually sexually abusing her 14-year-old daughter while they were together. And Angelo treated this woman like shit too, obviously. Yeah. But she stayed with him because, you know, she was being abused and he was threatening to kill her if she ever left. Eventually, she did leave in 1972 and he married a woman named Deborah. Dude, how does he get all these women? I'm sorry. I was going to say that. They got divorced shortly after. But <sighs> I love these people who get married like this all the time. Like, what's wrong? It with wasn't that? even just like. He was like, had a bunch of girlfriends. I was like, he's marrying a bunch of right. people. Well, that's like the cr- controlling part. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Because con- he's still going to fuck around. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And he's doing awful, awful things. And these women are, uh, you know, under his spell and they're in the abuse cycle. So they, they can't leave. By the mid 70s, Angelo was running his own car upholstery business. He didn't have any employees of his own. So he had the whole property of this building to himself right to do whatever and he that wanted that building i think is in glendale it is garage, in, yeah it is in glendale because our friend andy was going to take me to see it one time oh my god he was yeah because he's he's like i went to all the dump spots and i was like okay wait he did <laughs> that's what he told me and i was like i'll go on that tour with you like yeah we i did think that i was tour. like that's like a good first date like if a guy was like i'll take you to see I mean, Andy is gay, so I mean, it's a little bit safer probably than another guy telling me that. <laughs> that's the weird thing because even though that's something I would want to do, I would want to go see all the murder spots. If someone suggested that to me on a it first would be date, suspicious, right? It'd be a little wary. It's like, I'm intrigued, but scared. <laughs> right. What will I do? <laughs> what do I do? I want to see these murder spots. I know, it's like, it's a conflict. It's, it's a, a real, real conflict. It's a real conflict. <laughs> And for some reason, Angelo was attracting all these ladies, and he referred to himself as a ladies' man, which right. is so gross. He also referred to himself as the Italian stallion. Ugh. I mean, he does have this very seventies look with like the Afroy kind of. He's the like Italian, the Mister Cotter, and fro. The, the thick mustache, the push I mean, broom mustache, yeah, the push broom, right? And he wore gold chains yeah. and like his name's Angelo. <laughs> Come on, dude! This guy was such a fucking cliche. Yeah, like, Italian stallion. It's like, come on. And there's plenty of pictures of him too. So you'll get you'll lots get of those pictures, this week. Yeah. I already posted one tonight on our Twitter account. Kenneth Bianchi really looked up to his cousin. Like he thought his cousin was the shit, you know, right. fucking all these women, yeah. has his own business. 
calls himself the Italian Stallion. Yeah. I mean, Kenny Bianchi. I mean, can you imagine how how dumb you have to be to be like, wow, the Italian Stallion. Like, that's <laughs> impressive to you? Because it's like you it's haven't heard so... that nickname before. Like, come Wasn't on. that like Sylvester Stallone's name? Right. But maybe Rocky was after. When did Rocky Rocky's come out? like late 70s. Rocky was like 76. Yeah. So this is all happening around then, yeah. I guess. But I'm sure there's lots of people calling themselves the Italian Stallion. Yeah. It rhymes. It's not the most unique. Also, is a stallion really that hot? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Weigh in, listeners. Weigh in, listeners. Let us know if you think stallions Is that the hottest hot. animal? I don't know. Then there's Wild Stallions, the name of Bill and Ted's band. Oh, right. In Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Just, okay. That's a little fun I fact. mean, I feel like wolves might be hotter. <laughs> I think wolves are hotter. Yeah, but think, it doesn't rhyme with I Italian. Think, didn't we decide that the hottest animal was uh, the cartoon Fox version of Robin Hood? Oh, right. Yeah, he's pretty hot. Yeah. I also love Scar from Oh, Lion yeah. Does he love Scar? <laughs> he's really hot. Yeah, he's cute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. So Kenny looked up to his cousin, and Angelo took him under his wing and would tell him how to manipulate and control women and he you know there were several quotes i read where he's like you got it you never let a cunt have the upper hand you know right like he called women cunts a lot that's his like little like words of wisdom right yeah like these yeah these are the pearls of wisdom like he's like he's tony getting. robbins of serial killers <laughs> rapists they're both just you never give a cunt the upper hand it's right. like yeah i want that cross stitched on a pillow <laughs> <laughs> maybe i do actually they're both just awful, awful people. Right. So the two... I mean, talk about your misogynistic... Oh, my God. I mean, this is toxic masculinity to it. Totally. And, and, and besides the fact that they become criminal, these are people who treat women like a whole to fuck. Like, these are people who look at women as literally nothing. That's mm -hmm. really how they saw them. They saw them... Every single woman they came into contact with, they were conquests to them. Right. And how much pain can I inflict on this woman and she still stays with me? Right. And how Angelo is a little with? bit more attractive than kenneth like so yeah i mean i don't think he's attractive but he has that more kind of ladies man look than kenneth was right. like a bit more nerdy looking yeah or just average yeah i mean <sighs> so i can see how someone like that would be like oh i mean we all know that sociopathic men are really good sometimes with luring women in with their words right and convincing right. them that they're a catch right you but know? i feel like he wasn't unattractive like he's definitely a type that ladies go for i think of that era like right my mom would have probably dated him right <laughs> she liked like the john oates type. Oh, God. <laughs> i'm sorry she, she, like that look with the mustache and the curly the hair yeah she wasn't into hall she, she liked, liked the, the dark yeah she was, she was into the oats more on the edge look you don't know what trauma is until you hear your mom called john oates sexy <laughs> like a lot as a kid that's like one of the worst things that happened to me as a child. <laughs> and that's saying something. Okay. So yeah. So he looks up to a Angelo. When I was little, I thought the band name was called Hauling Oats. Like I'm hauling a bag of oats. <laughs> <laughs> like when I was that's really like young. A, that makes actually perfect sense. Yeah. Hauling Oats. Hauling Oats. <laughs> of course. I'm like, oh wait, it's the name of the two guys. H-A-U-L-I-N apostrophe yes, oats. apostrophe <laughs> oats. Like country style. Like yeah. Hauling Oats. I'm Hauling yeah. Oats. We do white soul. <laughs> We're hollow notes. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway. So they also had this method that they would do where they would like pretend to be police officers. Okay. Yeah. And this is a kind of a common thing with yes. uh, killers or like bad guys. Yes. I mean, and especially to lure women, to lure women yeah. into their car or whatever, to get them to do what they need to do. And Kenny, of course, wanted to be a police officer right. and could never get that job. Well, it's like that power. Yeah. I and mean, that's what we always talk about. Women talk about with sexual assault and a lot of this is a power thing. It's a power so thing. So Kenneth obviously felt powerless most of his life. Totally. So the two of them met two teenage runaways, Becky Spears and Sabra Hanan, and they manipulated these two women to work for them as sex workers. And they were going to be taking all of the money. Kenny was short on cash, so that was his primary motivation out of it. He wanted to pimp these two women out, young women, they're teenagers, and use them, just take all their money. Right. And since they were abusing them, they didn't really have a say in that. 
They were afraid to leave, obviously. And eventually these two women were able to escape. And then Kenneth and Angelo's additional source of income dried up. They then ended up meeting a sex worker named Deborah Noble, who promised to provide the men with a list of tricks that they could use. Tricks as in John's. Right. So this sex worker, Deborah Noble, was like, hey, I got a list of all the guys around town who who use us. Right. Like, I'll give this to you for a price if you're looking to become a pimp. And when Deb, the men, uh, Kenneth and Angelo. and Angelo gave Deborah the money for the list, she up and bounced. And she was never to be seen again. They tried to track her down. Oh, I love her. I know. I like Deborah too. She's yeah. fucking smart. And yeah. she could probably see these two fuckers were assholes. Right. So she fooled them. She fooled them. And obviously, if you've ever um, made a sociopathic man look like an idiot, they're going to lash out. Right. I mean, just look at Trump tweeting all day today about not getting a thank you. Right. If you they're, make... They're deeply wounded they're by the smallest lights the like. smallest lights these guys are like i'm not gonna take it right it's too humiliating they can't handle it well, because they're actually huge pussies totally so <clears throat> these guys weren't gonna let deborah get away with that but because they couldn't track her down they instead picked up her friend yolanda washington and she was also a sex worker she was 20 on October 17, 1977, the nude body of Yolanda Washington was found on a hillside by Forest Lawn Cemetery, mm -hmm. and she had been beaten, raped, and strangled. The corpse had been cleaned before it was dumped, and there was also evidence that there had been, there was ligature marks on her ankles and on her wrists, so she had been bound beforehand, before she was killed. Her body was also posed in a vulgar manner with her legs spread apart. Right. And the sad thing is the police, you know, this was a, a woman of color who was a sex, a sex worker. worker. And I don't, I don't know if there's any indication that things are any better today uh, with sex workers winding up dead i don't think they're, they're i don't kind think of never things, a high priority i don't think, I think things are any better today but right. well people like us are more aware of it and right. maybe make a bigger stink right even though the cops might still it's, put it aside it's not a high priority it's a tragedy right. um this is like one of the main reasons why i think sex work all of it should be legalized and unionized so to prevent these situations right. from happening or to curb we, a lot of this, yeah, I mean, definitely. that could be a whole other episode. I won't get on my soapbox right now. But, <laughs> um, you know, this woman, she was really pushed to the wayside, her case was. So they didn't, you know, they're like, oh, another, you know, dead hooker. And there's usually no family coming after them. Right. Like the cops, like pressing something to happen. Right. Because they a might lot of be times estranged. they're estranged from their family or what whatever or their family doesn't even know what to look for or where to look for them right so it's like a combination of horrible things uh, yeah it, it can be a lot of stuff so this wasn't a high priority with the lapd at the time and on november 1st 1977 uh this is a couple weeks later the body of 15 year old judith lynn miller was found in la in a la crescenta neighborhood she had also been raped and strangled and was also nude when she was found and also posed. Judy had been picked up by Kenneth and Angelo the night before, which was Halloween, in Hollywood while she was working on the street. The two men had flashed a badge at her to get her into the car. So they used that technique on her right. when she got in. And this girl was... 15 years old she's she's a runaway she's like her parents don't even know where she is right. her family has no idea where she is and they're using fake names and ids and stuff so a lot of times they don't even know their real names right right away so um the police also didn't take this with a high priority as was much. she white or she was white uh, -huh. uh the rest of their victims were um or most of them were, um, but because she was a sex worker, it was just it wasn't a high priority case for them, and still it was even after 
the previous one? Was this two different? This is precincts? two. Uh, well, it might be because I know La Crescenta, the area, La Crescenta is north yes. of Glendale. It was and, uh, two different. Forest Lawn is sort of maybe some in Glendale. I'm not sure. It's pretty big. It goes all the way into Burbank, which are right next to each other. Right. Um, right. It's like, and by, but it's all in the same area. It's generally. northeast Los yeah. Angeles, but it could be different police precincts. I, it might have been different precincts. Yeah, but there wasn't like a oh, there's a, oh here's yeah here's a serial killer, um, and also you have to kill three people to be considered a serial killer right. as well. But they weren't even like, well, this is something we should keep our eye on. No, they, it wasn't <laughs> yeah. a high priority. Yeah. So then, um, on November sixth, just a, like five days later. The naked body of 21-year-old waitress, Lissa Teresa Caston, was found dumped near the Chevy Chase Country Club. She also had ligature marks on her wrists and ankles. She also had signs that she had been raped. There was semen found, by the way, okay. in all of the victims oh, wow. with signs of rape trauma as well as... So the cleaning of the bodies was superficial. Like yes. they didn't clean the DNA. No, or there whatever, was still the DNA semen. evidence, but they didn't have DNA testing back then. Right. Um, but there was two different types of semen uh, found in some of these women also. And this woman was also strangled. It, it was the same. It was the same type of kill. Three days later, on November 9th, the nude body of prostitute Jill Barcombe was found near Beverly Hills. And like I said before, because most of the murders had been sex workers or runaways, this wasn't exactly headline making. Wow, in Beverly Hills. So that's near pretty, Beverly Hills. Right, but that's still pretty far away. It's far away. From where it's the typical where the other ones were. Right. But Jill was also a sex worker. Right. So they're not taking it as urgently. But this would all change very soon. Because on November thirteenth, Kenneth and Angelo abducted 12-year-old Dolores Cepeda and 14-year-old Sonia Johnson. The girls were leaving school and were seen talking to Kenneth and Angelo and then getting into their car. It's assumed that they also flashed the badges right. at these young girls who obviously would be scared. and To get into a car with men. Get into the car with the guys. And they were also runaways, so they... They probably thought they were in trouble. Right. And got caught. Right. And on November 20th, the two young girls were found naked, raped, and strangled on a hillside by Dodger Stadium. Oh, so like Echo Park. Yes. Which is like south of Glendale. Right. A little southeast. Yeah. I am your map authority. I live in the area, so I just know it really well. Right. I'm um, glad we have um, your the GPS <laughs> I'll put, I'll put my, my uh, smart glasses on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, what is it called? Cesar Ravine or Chavez Ravine area is that what it's called right by dodger stadium right it's very hilly it was I on mean, like stadium way it was oh, off stadium way stadium yeah. way is off of where she was found so that's off the one they were found right okay yeah. right chavez ravine i think it's like a, a good dumping place i guess right so now like so these, these are two teens. young girl yeah. young you know and yeah. and not assumed to be sex workers so this is like now making some buzz around the neighborhood like we have a serial killer which is usually the complaint where it's like oh when it's two little white girls everyone cares but not right, right. yeah i mean right. this is like and it's classic i mean yeah. it's a complaint for a very good reason right um so the very same day that exact same day police found another body shit I yes mean, they did a lot that's that's a lot it's a lot uh they discovered 20 year old christina weckler and she was discovered on a hillside, again, another hillside, near Glendale. She had also been strangled. And on this body, there were signs of torture. So the killers appeared to have been escalating with their victims. Right. Because remember, the, the two young girls were abducted November 13th. And um, then they weren't even found till the 20th. So we don't know when her... Christina Weckler. I don't right. know when Christina Were Weckler they was taken. And tortured for a while, or was the body just not found? Right. right. So she was discovered on a hillside near Glendale. Um, she also had injection marks on her body. Oh God! And the killer had been injecting cleaning fluid into Ugh. her for whatever reason. And that's like Dahmer. Did oh, that yeah, that? Dahmer right. did do that to try to um, lobotomize them or make them zombies. Right? Yeah, Dahmer Sex slaves. He, Dahmer injected cleaning fluid into his victims, his later victims' brain into into their heads 
because he wanted to create Sex living slaves. zombies. Yeah. Didn't work out. No. I mean, <laughs> it's a little complicated. Yeah. More complicated Dahmer's not that. a scientist. No. He had no idea what he was doing. Then on November 23rd, just one day before Thanksgiving in 1977, the nude body of 28-year-old Jane King was found dumped by the 5 Freeway on-ramp. Jane had been missing since November 9th, so her body was pretty decomposed. Right. Again, we have the same pattern. We have ligature marks. We have signs of rape. We have signs of beatings. Were they still being posed or just dumped now? Uh, not all of them were posed. Well, they're being dumped down hills a lot. They're being dumped on hills. Right. So they're literally just dropped down. Right. Some of them. I've seen some of the crime scene photos where it's literally cameras pointing down. I've seen them too. And a woman just, you know, sprawled out or whatever. They're all naked. naked. Yeah. They're all naked. I mean, it's disturbing. It's really disturbing. It's not posed at that point, I think. I mean, I can't even imagine. Like, we don't, like, I mean, I talk about this, like, a lot, but, like, um, you know, we live in a time where we don't have the same kind of serial killer panic that we had in the 70s and 80s. Right. When it seemed like they were more frequent or more in the news. But the scary thing is, you know, they're going on right now. We just don't know that, that do they're happening. So? I do. And I do feel like people maybe are better at covering it up and right. hiding it. Because we think know, about, so, like, much we know so much and all these shows are on the air. And I'm not saying that people actually like watch them for training but i bet you that they <laughs> learn things like don't you think like right have you ever thought in your own head like oh i would have never done that i would have done like even though right. you would never murder someone you try to think of like course. how to not get caught right right like, I, I can't be the only one who does that they're actually but, yeah i mean yeah. i bet you there's things going on and i think of that all the time like right now someone could be killing people and we don't even know yet right or the bodies aren't even ever like found. think about if you went into all these different states like if you your transportation is so much easier now. People meet meet people online. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's going to be some crazy ass fucking story that comes out soon. There or was the a story that came out, um, and I saved it in my phone. The Atlanta one? No. Oh, there's one in Atlanta too. There was one in Connecticut. This guy, William Devil Howell. He also has the three name right. signature, which is not an official. Uh, it's not an official trait, but of it's a pretty. Uh, yeah. This guy. Um, this is from People Magazine. The Connecticut serial killer who drove a, quote, murder mobile and buried his victims in what he called, quote, his garden was sentenced on Friday. This is like this last Friday to life in prison for his crimes, People confirms. When were the crimes committed? Two years ago. Oh, OK. I haven't even heard this or, case. No, they weren't committed. No, this he got is busted two years ago. I'm actually confused by this case because it says at the time of his arrest, Howell was already serving a 15 year prison sentence for manslaughter. Right. So I think that's implying that he was in prison when he was arrested for, he was in prison for a separate crime. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, so anyway, I, I, I was looking up modern serial killers, right. Googling because that's something I do, I guess. And I was really shocked to see that there was, you just don't, I just don't know if you don't hear about it as much maybe, but also I agree with what you said. I, the thing that I think about is I wonder if not only are they better at hiding or disposing of bodies, but I wonder if there's any chance that certain serial killers also switch up their signature with each body to not link the right I, that's, what I, that's what i was saying i feel like they do know a little bit more now although a lot of them do want to get caught so it's like this weird right but i would i wouldn't doubt that there are people who do not want to get caught right i just, you just don't, i mean this guy i didn't i had to like look up serial killers this guy didn't make headlines no i didn't hear this at all yeah so okay anyway well this is going to be a two-parter episode so that's that's where i'm going to leave you off is with that thanksgiving murder because oh i thought it was a good place to stop is because yeah. it's thanksgiving this week and we what don't you, what we are don't, you thankful for um i'm really thankful for the show i'm really thankful for our patreon contributors which oh, i didn't i'm gonna to, thank them now yeah. yeah okay we got a few of them this, this week. week which is really exciting yes i'm also thankful the show is 
done really well this month. So we have a ton of new listeners. So thank you for sharing yeah. the show or Thanks I'm assuming for talking you're about all it. telling your friends or something. Right. We um, had a ton of downloads this month. Um, and then while Rachel's pulling out the Patreons, I also wanted to say, check out our Facebook um, friend group, I guess. It's yeah. A, it's a, so look up Hollywood Crime Scene Friends and we'll uh, add you. I think you have to request it. And then it's a fun group where people are sharing uh, stories and talking about stories that we um, talked. They're giving us suggestions of stories that they want to hear. So you can do that as well. Yeah, it's really fun. Uh, yeah, it's really like fun. It. So check it out. Right. Um, um, and also, then our Patreons. Also, our Patreons, we had a bunch this week. We had, let's see, uh, Lauren, Chris, John, Raul, Allison, Joe, Monica, and Kara. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys so much. It really helps us out. I mean, like, this is a full-time job to put on this show. <laughs> we love doing it. It's a lot of it, research. It's fun. But it's a lot of work. We would love to do more, so the money helps. And we have some cool ideas. I just thought of one during the show, but maybe it can be a perk, so we'll work it out. I yeah. think it will be really interesting and cool. Okay, cool. So maybe we'll make that a new uh, high-ticket perk because <laughs> it would be a lot of work. But it would be fun. <gasps> yeah. And I think people would love it. Totally. So, uh, yeah. For five dollars, you get bonus episodes. Yeah, and then you can even donate a dollar. Like we love it all. It's yeah, it's all helpful. So we'll give yeah. you a show shout out, no yeah. matter how much you donate. But if you do donate five bucks, you get access to additional content, which, which is, is a week once a week. So yeah. four additional episodes that are usually a little bit more lighthearted and filthy. Yeah, uh, Hollywood type of stuff that's right. more fun. But yeah. yeah, so thank you and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye. Bye.